Hey everyone, just a quick reminder that the Plains of Fame Air Museum in Chino, California is holding its annual Namesake Air Show Saturday and Sunday, May 4th and 5th, 2019. Aerial performances include the U.S. Air Force F-16 Viper demo and over 50 historic aircraft such as the P-38 Lightning, Spitfire, P-51 Mustang, and many more. Admission for children 11 and under is free, and tickets are available for advanced purchase on their website, planesoffame.org. That's the Planes of Fame Air Show in Chino, California, May 4th and 5th, 2019. Gates open at 8 a.m. This week on the Fighter Pilot Podcast, retired United States Air Force Reserve Colonel Mike Terrell Day joins us to explain what it's like to fly the most exciting and prolific Western fighter of the modern jet age. It's basically a single seat with a high visibility bubble canopy, single engine, single tail, side stick, frontline fighter. And when you sit in it, I'd say about 75% to 80% of the airplane is behind you. So you have this feeling that you're at the end of a pencil and you're flying a magic carpet. Clear the kill. Clear the kill. Strap in for the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here are your hosts, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilots Vincent Aiello and Brian Sinclair. Hello and welcome to episode 45 of the Fighter Pilot Podcast. That's right, we will be talking about the F-16 Fighting Falcon, better known as the Viper. But Sunshine, before that, man, last episode on the A-10 was a huge hit. It was Jello. I mean, I absolutely love the interview with Supa there, and uh, all the Burt jokes were pretty good too, huh? <laughs> yeah, everybody loved the comms that we used in the opening bumper, and just all around our most listened to episode yet, at least on opening day. And the follow up behind the scenes that we had on our YouTube channel, people also found that very useful for Supa to point out some of the features on the A10 in the video. Yeah, and I was surprised, uh, impressed really, that the uh, the numbers beat out the F14 episode. So, good on Supa and you. Well, I attribute that to our ever-growing audience, which is a great thing, and we're having a lot of fun, so they're tuning in to hear all they can about air combat and military aviation. For announcements, Sunshine, did you hear about the F-35A that crashed off the coast of Japan? Holy cow, Jello! Yeah, I did just recently. I didn't realize that. Uh, well, here we're, we're you know recording this on April 18th, right? So just a few days ago, and I guess the last call heard by the pilot that Major Hasami was a knock it off call before he splashed into the water. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And to uh, add a finer point to that, yes, this is 2019. And what strikes me as interesting about it, I mean, normally we don't do a lot of current events on this show, but what I think is pretty fascinating is that it has turned into a hunt for the Red October-esque search for the wreckage. Because, of course, the Americans and the Japanese want to protect it and find that information. And you've got some other players in the region there that are also looking because, hey, guess what? That's how a lot of military information is obtained in the world these days is get your hands on it any way you can. Yeah, I know back in uh, the Russian days with Stalin, right? He did a lot of technical exploitation, if you will, by looking at crashed allied fighters and whatnot. So, or crashed enemy fighters, excuse me. Yeah, sure. Uh, And other announcements, you and I had a deep dive recently on BFM, but we ended up with some tech challenges again. I thought it was really good information, but we just, I think we need to have a better plan going forward. What are your thoughts? Yeah, Jello, totally agree with you, man. I was was pretty bummed when I heard the, uh, obviously we recorded it live, and then when I heard the playback, I was less than impressed, I would say. So I think it's almost a limitation of the, uh, the, the doing the live thing. That would be specifically the sampling rate and the bandwidth provided by my internet service provider. But I think in the future, how about we just do a recording and then we'll push it out to the folks. That way we can better control the audio and the video. Yeah, I like that. Plus, it's such good content. We should almost do like a year-long syllabus where everything is lockstep, almost like taking a class. And then who knows, maybe at the end we can have a little hoopla 
give people like a pop quiz, and if they submit and get better than a certain score, we can send them some geed hunk or something just for fun. Yeah, dude, that's a great idea. And as far as the live stuff goes, I mean, people enjoy watching live, so maybe we just need to get back together once in a while and do your right, wrong, righteous, and ridiculous on another flying movie or something, because people seem to enjoy that, but we haven't done one in a while. Totally agree, dude. That one, also a live Q&A session would probably bode well, too. Oh, yeah, for sure. Okay, uh, let's see. A couple more announcements, and we'll get to questions. So on the intermission episode we played at the beginning of April, apparently I had mentioned that I could not remember when I had an engine failure, and a listener reminded me that I had said on a previous episode wow. that I had one on my 2003 fly-in when I was just about to land in front of my family, and I completely forgot that. And I think the reason I did is it wasn't all that eventful. I basically went around and landed on the other runway. But yeah, no, never an engine failure when it really mattered. Certainly not like yours that you chronicled in your recent musing story coming off the deck there in El Centro. Well, that's a good thing, Jello. So and good on the listener for uh, being able to identify <laughs> that tidbit, that soundbite. That's awesome. So that's right. Nice. Hey, Jello, when it comes to Patreon, any uh, news there? Holy smokes, as always, Patreon's going big. Let's see for division leads. And I'll just read this the way they sign themselves up. So we have Someone named Mr. Johan A.K. And okay. we have Sterling Widmer, mm-hmm. Tim William, Ian F. McFarland, and that's in all caps. <laughs> so I think he's hollering at us from overseas, perhaps. Yep. And Martin Jaspers. And then we have a new Patreon mission commander, Johannes Hillstead. And then Louis Serda, who was a strike lead, upgraded to Air Boss. Ooh, so nice. I am in the process of sending him his FPP polo that he gets to wear and an autographed print of an F-35. And we're trying to work out a time to get on the phone and chat. And so, yeah, the higher up you go, the more bennies you get. And we're just so grateful for the support of the Patreon folks. It just really helps keep the show going. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, gents, Lewis, and, and the, uh, the cadre there, if you will. And with any luck, we can use some of that, that money to uh, help improve our audio, specifically uh, <laughs> our deep dives. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Well, and everything else. No, yeah. it keeps things going. And, and uh, yeah, we can certainly put it to continuous improvement. Absolutely. Cool, man. Hey, uh, when it comes to questions, so do we have any good listener questions for this round? We do. We have one from Richard Borden, who is a Patreon mission commander, speaking of Patreon. And he asks, what brand of watch do you wear while flying or did you wear while fighter pilots and why? Did you use your watch as another tool in the toolbox to help you perform your job? If so, in what ways did you use your timepieces for mission accomplishment? Sunshine, there was a lot of guys out there who had the big Breitling watches with a F-16 or F-14 logo on it. Man, I wore a cheap Casio or for a while I had an Omega that I got as a gift. But honestly, before GPS, it was important to put a time hack in the jet. But ever since then, you can fly without one, and I never really made a big deal about watches. What about you? Yeah, I'm with you, Jello. So I did do one squadron buy. It was during TPS, so it was, I guess, a class buy of an Omega Speedmaster where we got our name and our TPS graduate number on the back, and that was kind of cool. But cool. but up to mm-hmm. that point, prior to that, when I flew the S3 and also the Charlie before we had GPS, I had the same kind of Casio <laughs> uh, nondescript watch that you get for about 25 bucks, and I'd, I'd hack it. Mm-hmm in the ready room prior to walking up to the jet so I could give a good hack to the jet. And honestly, I pretty much rolled my glove over top of my watch in flight, so I didn't use it much at all. Okay. Things kind of changed, though, when I went to the depot. So here at the depot, we reconditioned the old kind of tire jets, if you will, right, and take them flying. Well, recently there's been a big string, as our listeners probably remember or now know, about the um, cabin pressurization issues. And it uh, pretty much was systemic across the legacy platform from lot nine and above. And so as a uh, quick reaction, I guess you could say, CNAF said, hey, give all the pilots these Garmin Phoenix 3 HR, as in heart rate, watches. And these Garmin Phoenix 3s had three HRs, I guess. They actually had uh, barometric altimeters in them. So they could report the altitude. And you could set a digital alarm to them. So if the altitude climbed above a certain really a PSI, right? But if it climbed above a certain altitude, then your watch would vibrate. So we could use these and we could also, but it would record the information on a time scale. So it'd show you the different pressures versus times. So you could actually bring it back, download it onto a computer, and you could watch the cabin pressurization profile. And it, it actually helped to diagnose my uh, type two decompression sickness. Wow. So at that point, you're wearing a piece of avionics on your wrist where you would normally wear a wristwatch, it sounds like. Yeah, I totally got a big upgrade from a Casio to that uh, $500 Garmin. Sure. 
And not to take away from the Omega watch you bought and the Brightlings that other guys buy. I'm sure they enjoy it. But yeah, for me, it was just never something I wanted to spend the money on. But anyway, all right, that's pretty cool. All right, next, let's take a phone call from John. Hey, Joe, this is John Rapia from Central Minnesota. Just heard your latest episode, by the way, on the A-10 Warthog. And it's just brought into mind a question I've been sitting on for a while. Pros, benefits of using a mostly multi-mission, like the F-A-18, for like a carrier air wing to be mostly made up of, or the how we were coming out of Vietnam and into the modern day, a uh, wing built up of mostly primarily task aircraft, like primary fighters, F-4, and the F-14, primary attackers, A-6. You know, pros and benefits of using multi-mission aircraft versus just primary mission aircraft, or they're really good at one thing, or maybe a second, but that's it. Anyway, thank you, sir. Keep up the good work. All right, John, so thanks for the question. So, Sunshine, what it sounds like he's asking is, is it better to have multi-mission aircraft that can do a lot of things, but maybe not one thing well, or maybe some aircraft that can do one thing well, and maybe a second thing sort of good, but I don't know. What are your thoughts on the matter? Well, I think a lot of it is going to come down to dollars nowadays. And with those dollars, I think about reliability of maintenance. So if we have a whole bunch of airplanes that all use the same parts, and so the logistics trail, if you will, is a lot smaller, right, than having a whole series of different primary mission focused uh, fighters like, hey, here's a here's all the parts for the A6. Here's all the parts for the F-14. So when it comes to maintenance, I think it's better. But Jello, as you and I know, we mentioned a lot before these uh, these modern fighters, they're a series of compromises, right? So just like you said, they don't do anything, one specific thing really well. They do a whole series of things adequately well. So I am actually a big fan of doing the, uh, the multi-role fighters just for convenience and for cost. And convenience, I mean, hey, if a guy gets sick and needs to re-roll into a different mission, you don't have to worry about only pulling from a certain squadron. You can actually have different squadrons fill or kind of have a redundancy through other squadrons of the, the different missions. So I'm a fan of multi-roll. How about you? Yeah, no, I agree. And it is a trade-off. I mean, the government has to decide how to spend the precious taxpayer dollars. And if you have purpose-built aircraft, well, then it's probably going to cost you more, but they might be more effective. If you have a program like the Joint Strike Fighter, where there's commonality, at least implied or intended, then you can save money theoretically. And so there's no good real answer to that, John. I mean, if you're asking our opinion, sure. In a perfect world, I would love to have a series of aircraft that all do something really well, and they'd all be sourced correctly and train pilots and crew, but I just don't think that's the world we live in anymore. Yeah, I agree. All right. I think we have time for one more quick question, and this one is from Rolando. You want to read this one? You bet. Rolando in Guatemala asks, regarding the F-15, the 16, the 14, and the Super Hornet, and assuming only experienced pilots in a 1v1 guns-only environment, I know that in addition to pilot experience, there are many more variables. But let's say that the following for both jets. So I guess they're going to engage in one, the Super Hornet and one of these others. 70% okay. fuel, roughly 400 knots at the merge. I'm assuming a high aspect merge. They're at the same altitude, kind of medium altitude. He asks, have we ever fought against those? What are our thoughts? And can the Hornet beat all of them? Or are some of the fighters just too hard for the Hornet to beat? <laughs> Well, Sunshine, you and I spoke a little bit about this in our deep dive, which is still available on our Facebook page. And Rolando, thanks for the question. And by the way, I'm going to be in Guatemala City next month on a layover. Nice. So maybe we'll have to hook up. Yeah. Anyway, I did have a chance to fight the F-15, 16, and 14 in my Hornet. Not so much in the Super Hornet, but... I would say it goes back to what we talked about on the deep dive and what you'll hear a little bit about in this upcoming episode with T-Day, and that is you have to fly to your aircraft strengths and your adversary's weaknesses and try to drive the type of fight you want, because if you're successful in doing that, you can win in any of these aircraft against the others. But if you allow yourself to get into a situation where you are at a disadvantage, then you could get beat. But I do remember being fairly successful against the F-14 and the F-15. They're large and the F-16, though, it puts up a darn good fight. Have you had a chance to go up against these guys, Sunshine? Uh, I went up against an F-15 out of McDill a long time ago, and that was the first time I've ever seen a plane do a double Immelman on me. 
And I, <laughs> I could not follow him uphill, so I didn't have the kinematics, and I had to basically turn and point toward the ground, and then he found my control zone very easily. But, uh, <laughs> but that's not only... I don't want to you know uh, use the quality of the box, we'll call it, as a, an excuse. It obviously is... And it's all dependent upon the man who sits in the box, as you guys reference in the interview coming up. So anyway, I flew against the F-15. I flew against the F-16. Yeah, and I just want to try to drag him slow, as you know. Never flew, never dog fought, excuse me, an F-14. So Okay. Well, that's too bad you missed out. It was a lot of fun. But yeah, those days are gone now. So, well, hey, tell you what, with that segue being the man in the box, as you said, and the F-16 and all that, why don't we just jump into the interview? It's a little bit longer anyway, and I say we get right into it. Let's do it. Today, the Fighter Pilot Podcast is in Phoenix, Arizona, and we are joined by retired United States Air Force Reserve Colonel Mike Tareel Day, call sign T-Day. T-Day, welcome to the show, buddy. Thanks. Nice to be here. Excellent. Well, we are called the Fighter Pilot Podcast. We talk about a lot of aircraft that are not fighters. But today, we're talking about one of the premier fighters of all time, I would argue. I think you're right. All right. Well, before we get to the F-16, and we'll argue over names in a moment, let's hear a little bit about Mike Toriel Day. Where are you from? What was your career like? And what are you doing now? Okay, so I uh, grew up in Tracy, California. Uh, it's about 80 miles east of San Francisco. Went to high school there, graduated, went to the uh, Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. Graduated in 1987, and after uh, graduating from flight school, I uh, deployed all over the contiguous United States, uh, the Middle East, uh, the Pacific. In the F-16? Uh, in the F-16 okay. and, and in the OV-10 oh, for wow. a couple of years before that. Okay. A very career. Um, Got to be in a lot of operations. Uh, finally retired as a, as a colonel, like you mentioned, in the reserves. And I amassed about 5,500 military flying hours and wow. uh, about just shy of 4,200 in the F-16. Wow. Okay. And how many years of total service? Uh, about 29 years and eight months, to Holy be exact. Holy smokes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> well, normally I wait till the end to say thanks for your service, but on behalf of freedom-loving people everywhere, thanks, T-Day. That is quite the sacrifice. Some of that was active, some of that was reserved, right? That is correct. Okay. Uh, it's my honor and my pleasure to to have served. Uh, and uh, 12 and a half years of, of those 29-plus years was, uh, was on active duty. Wow. Okay. And what are you doing now? I'm a uh, airline pilot, uh, and I fly the uh, Boeing 777. Excellent. And I think just before we met, you were in, what, Tokyo yesterday? I was in Tokyo. That's correct, <laughs> yes. All right. So your body gets used to the flying around the world time shifts and all that on your circadian rhythm. I'm working on it, yeah. Outstanding. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the F-16 Fighting Falcon, or would you rather talk about something else? <laughs> no, that's fine. We can talk about the F-16 Viper all day. Uh, uh, well, oh, well, wait a minute. Which one is it? Well, uh, <laughs> as you know, pilots who fly an aircraft get to name it, okay, regardless so, of what the engineers name it first. Right, so the A-10 we call the Thunderbolt two, and the, someone with probably tape between the uh, nose piece of his glasses, called this the Fighting Falcon, but it's been universally known as the Viper since what? Creation, just about? Uh, pretty much. Um, you know, there's a couple of reasons why people call it that. Uh, the first one is, if you've ever fought an F-16 and you're behind it, in about, you know, three to four seconds, it's pointing at you. <laughs> so it has this ability to basically, it almost looks like it's rotating in space, much like a, like a snake viper mm -hmm. does that, where it can just flip its fangs 180 degrees and about, you know, instantaneously. Okay. So that's one of the reasons. Then the other reason, a lot of the old heads that flew the, flew the jet when it came out, there was an old TV show called uh, Battlestar Galactica. Oh, yeah. And uh, the fighters that they had were called the Viper. Ooh. And it was uh, very similar, uh, sleek looking, and... If you ever look at that old show and they show the cockpit of that colonial fighter, the side stick that they use looks exactly like what came in the F-16A model. <laughs> okay. Plus, it just sounds cooler than Fighting Falcon. Can we A all agree bit. on that? A little bit. Okay. Fantastic. All right. Well, you've listened to the show. You know the drill. We're going to talk all about the F-16, the variants, the weapons, all that. But first, I mean, I kind of alluded to it in the opening. Other than... A Spitfire, maybe a P-51. I mean, is there any more famous, proliferated, prolific 
fighter than an F-16? I'm not so sure there is. Yeah, well, if you look at fighter history, it seems that every generation has developed what you would call the quintessential dogfighting airplane. Sure. Started with the Sopwith Camel in World War I. Right. Probably the P-51 in uh, World War II. The F-86 in Korea. Mm-hmm. Uh, Vietnam, our fighters were more um, what McDonnell Douglas builds, i.e. beefy, powerful <laughs> airplanes. Right. And they had problems with light, nimble airplanes like the MiG-21 and the MiG-17. Mm-hmm. Uh, so from Vietnam, um, the Air Force decided that they wanted to build a lightweight dogfighting airplane. And that's what became of the F-16. That's right. I want to say that Colonel John Boyd had a hand in it. And that's why, for example, it doesn't have an, a self-contained ladder because he didn't want any extra weight. <laughs> and we have on this show before spoken about the lightweight fighter, I want to say it was called, competition. Yes. And the F-16 turned out to be arguably the greatest fighter of all time, I would submit. And the loser turned into another very good, if not great, fighter, and that is the F-A-18. But the F-18 has had its moment here on the show. And so today it's about the F-16 Viper. And I'll go ahead and succumb to that one because that makes sense. All right. Well, let's start with what it was designed to do. Okay. So as you said, it was a lightweight fighter competition. So the Air Force was looking for a fighter that could do a dual role mission, i.e. air to air and air to ground, but that it was a economical airplane, a small airplane that could be mass produced, And you could have a large quantity of it, uh, you know, to do a lot of the work that you would need to do Mm -hmm. on on a daily basis. And so simple, I would argue, uh, clean, efficient, and designed from the outset. I don't think I knew this for both air to air and air to surface. I thought maybe it was just for air to air. No, no. Uh, It was air to air and air to surface. As a matter of fact, you know, the air to air was fairly limited. It could only carry infrared missiles. Yeah, AIM-9 Sidewinder at first. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's the only thing it could do. And then air to ground, mainly just free fall general purpose bombs. Okay. Uh, But, you know, that was the the mid-70s, early 80s before uh, precision guided munitions uh, really started to come in uh, in in full force. Okay. And we'll talk about the variants and some of the capabilities they all bring here in a little bit. All right. So that was what it was designed to do. With your vast experience and knowing the way it's employed and the way it's used around the country, if you could say one thing that it's particularly good at, what would you say if I had to hold you to just one? Hmm. Is it possible to hold it to just one? That's difficult. And and I'll tell you why. Uh, Because in the Air Force, it's basically the the jack of all trades and master of none, because we do everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, Everything from counter air to interdiction to close air support to air defense. Um, But, you know, it'll always be known as a dogfighting machine. And Uh, it is. And until the advent of the F-22, they're really, you know, it was pretty much at at the apex of that uh, that requirement right Right. there. My only argument, and I don't want to get ahead here, but my only argument with that statement would be in a slow fight. But if you kept the F-16 fast, or if you did get slow and you had an opportunity to get fast, then boy, it would bite you. Because if, if I could, in my Hornet, get you slow in your Viper, then I had a chance. But if I got slow and you didn't, then I was doomed. And I think if you and I were both proficient in both, we could go out and we might each win one in one aircraft and then each one win, win one in the other. So yeah, they, Yes, and, and you know, you're kind of you're bringing up the, uh, the, the old time-tested uh, thing that, uh, you know, uh, the Red Baron von Richthofen said. And he said, it's not the crate that matters, it's the man in it. That's right. And I am paraphrasing, obviously. Sure. But any aircraft that you fly, you want to fight to its strengths and right. avoid its weaknesses. And you just basically name yeah. uh, the strengths and weaknesses of the Hornet and the Viper. That's right. And you're absolutely right. I don't want to get slow unless you're in front of me. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> then you want to stay back there. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I believe the uh, quote was, uh, success relies on, it doesn't have something to do with a man in the box. Now, you're retired. Are you still not allowed to say box? <laughs> yeah, I, I guess <laughs> Old I habits could. Die Old hard. habits die hard, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, because I was supposed to get fined for Top Gun quotes at some point, <laughs> I guess. All right, fair enough. You know, it's funny to hear you say jack of all trades, master of none, because from an outsider's perspective with only 170 hours, I thought it was pretty darn good at a lot of things and maybe even master at a few. But like anything, it gets 
so spread out. I mean, we'll talk about it in a moment, but you do suppression of enemy air defenses, you do yes. the air to air, you do the air to the surface. And as modifications come along, you always have trade offs. So, but to your point, you slick it off all the pylons, all the weapons, all the ordnance, and man, it's an amazing dogfighter. Mm -hmm. But you hang all that on it, and suddenly, if you get to a point where you're about taking off and you don't have enough power and you, you lose your one and only engine, then you're really in trouble. So Correct. a trade-off, as all aircraft are, as we like to say on this show, and sounds like that's no different for the F-16. All right, so this could probably take the bulk of our discussion today. Let's see if we can make our way through the variants. And with the variants, not just like an F-16A per se, but let's talk about what the A has when it comes to the weapons. And then later, if we haven't covered them all, we can come back to them. But we have, in the F-18, we have lots. And in the F-16, I believe you have blocks. Correct. But then each of us also has our nomenclature with a, an alphanumeric suffix, like the A and the B and et cetera. So let's just start at the top okay. uh, with the F-16A. And then if you need to split out with the blocks and all that, you can do that. But let's take it from the top. All right, so the, the F-16A and B, and the, the second letter always denotes the two-seater. Right, just uh, like an F-18. Exactly. Okay. And, you know, they were the original airplanes, day VFR, lightweight, uh, you know, general purpose for air-to-ground weapons and sidewinders uh, for air-to-air -air only. Mm -hmm. Now, along the way, those aircraft were upgraded uh, where they could be uh, fitted with uh, AIM-7 Sparrow missiles, okay. uh, which are radar-guided, right. uh, and also um, um, identifiers uh, to, uh, you know, to, to ID mm -hmm. uh, enemy aircraft. Right. So that happened in, in late 80s, early 90s. Uh, so that, those were the basic airplanes, and much like the Hornet, the A and the B are the best dogfighters because they are the lightest That's right. airplanes with the lightest nose, and you get tremendous rate uh you know when when you need to apply it before someone started adding all the junk to it right that's correct okay and to your point the f-16 a and b's have for the most part been upgraded now and we've talked before on the show about the fa 18 a plus which was the body and systems if you will of an f-18 a but then you change the brains and some of the avionics and so you have a hybrid between the a and the c you and might. most f Sixteen A's have gone through what, uh, like a midlife upgrade? Oh. Yes, uh, okay. and and a lot of the uh, uh, European air forces got those modifications, and it basically made the F sixteen A up to F sixteen C as far as avionics mm -hmm. and capability, carrying armor, um, AMRAM, mm -hmm. um, uh, radar missiles for air to air, carrying uh, PGMs, precision guided munitions right. like the JDAM and the uh, laser guided bombs, Paveway two and three. So even those A's are up to speed with, you know, the C's and the D's of today. Right. I want to make a caveat, a shout out for my uh, buddies in Fallon. So I think they still have the oldest F-16s in existence because these were Block 15 A models yes. and B's yes. that were supposed to go to Pakistan. Correct. And then when they went to Fallon after 10 years of rigmarole, they finally got them and started flying them. And while all the rest of the world's F-16As and Bs got upgraded, theirs are still the old Flickus. You might remember those yes. from your early days, yes, the absolutely. old flight analog. control system analog and analog. Flickus, yep. yes. mm -hmm. And so when I left there, I was trying to get those upgrades and I lost the battle. So I hope my successors are having more luck. But they're, I think, the last of them. And the Air Force had some of those too. And I think they've turned them into drones. We can get to that in a moment. So that's F-16As and Bs. And where did that stop with the blocks? Like what's the first C and D blocks you recall? I, I believe the, the first ones were block zeros, then block fives, block tens. And okay. then they ended up with the block 15, right. which I believe is what, what right. the, you got. Uh, okay. The Navy is flying as aggressors in Fallon. And there were some changes between the 10 and the 15 with the size of the horizontal stabilizers Correct. and a few things. Correct, All right. because of the tendency of, of uh, you know going out of control right. with, with the small stabs. So they learned from some of the aerodynamic challenges and made corrections. Okay, so then when we get to the C and D and the blocks, talk us through those as well as the blocks like a 30 and a 32 yep. is different, right? So help us understand all that, please. All right, you bet. Uh, so the uh, C started with the block 30 and the block 32. The difference between 30 and 32 is an engine. That's it? That's it. Okay. I mean, the avionics and everything else are comparable. Uh, so the 30 has a GE engine. The 32 has a Pratt & Whitney engine. And amongst pilots who've flown it, 
most pilots will want to fly the GE. Right. It's more responsive. GE produces thrust with airflow. Pratt produces uh, thrust with heat. Hmm. So below 20,000 feet, the GE operates a lot better because there's a lot of air. Above 20,000 feet, the Pratt tends to work a little bit better because it doesn't need a lot of air. It just cranks up the heat to give right. you a thrust to but, create that differential. But why have two different ones? Yeah, I believe it was uh, they didn't want to source just a single engine. They always wanted the competition. And also, you know, um, procurement tends to be highly political. Oh, yes. And, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. I, I think that was just a way to diversify okay. the, the, the resources, where they were built, where the jobs were given to different parts of the country. Right. And, you know, I mean, well, I'm not into politics, but that's how it was explained to me. They didn't want to just single source it. And that makes two of us. But there's an element of this, and I don't know if this is true in this case, but mm -hmm. I know that the United States will look at certain industries and say, you know, it's really in our best interest to keep more than one provider here. So let's say just off the cuff that Pratt & Whitney was struggling. And if they mm -hmm. didn't get this deal, they were going to go under. Sure. Well, then they might have said, hey, you know what, let's split because it is it, to our benefit to keep the, not just for jobs, but for technology, because sure. maybe down the line, Pratt and Whitney discovers something that GE doesn't. And so it's just in our best interest. So sure. And, right. and you know, obviously we're in a ca capitalistic system where, right. where works through competition. So uh, that's not necessarily, you know, it's probably yeah. just in, in our blood, the way we do things. Right. Okay. So we start with the C's and the D's and again, the single and the two seater and the GE and Pratt and Whitney is the two. Okay. All right. And talk us through some of the improvements that came along and how far have we ended up in the block system? The latest block that U.S. Air Force flies in the F-16 is the Block 50 and the Block 52. Okay. But there are other blocks that other countries have, have purchased, and we'll cover that. So the Block 3032 still had an analog flight control system, much like the A, but it had better av avionics, uh, better radar. Uh, it was an upgraded radar. Um, and it, like I said, it started carrying when the AMRAM came about, it could carry the AIM-120, which is basically the, the, the standard that's used by the U.S. Air Force even now, right. uh, obviously more modern missiles. It also started to carry the laser guided bombs and, and all that. It was wired for other systems that were not used. When the Block 4042 followed on, mm -hmm. that was a, uh, digital flight control system and upgraded avionics it also included gps which up until the block 4042 that was not included in any, in any of the airplanes subsequent all the block 30s and 32s have gps all the avionics have been upgraded but again like in in anything the block 3032 was a lot lighter than the block 40 42 right. or 50 52 so as far as dogfighting Probably, if you talk to guys that have flown all blocks, they'll tell you that the Block 30 is kind of the best trade-off between thrust and, uh, you know, performance mm -hmm. uh, compare. You know, the Block 50 has enormous thrust, but it's a little bit heavier airplane. Sure. They just started adding more and more boxes so it could you do bet. more things, whether it's link or exactly. sensors or whatever. Getting back to the engines real quick, will one squadron have both or will it just have one? Generally, no. Okay. Uh, usually, uh, usually a whole wing normally, oh. normally will have one, one either, you know, 40 or 42 or right. 30 or 32. And it keeps the logistics something. a little simpler, the supply exactly. chain and all that. Okay. Exactly. And just speaking of blocks real quick, have you, what have you, is there any you've not flown? Obviously some of the real eclectic foreign stuff, but have you pretty much flown the whole gambit? I have flown every block except the block five and the block 10. <laughs> <laughs> a model which were probably early 70s yes. uh, okay awesome uh, that's amazing and so would you agree then that the 30 was that your favorite as well um depends what you're doing obviously yeah it does uh i, I really like the block 50 okay. um it almost at times it had more thrust than than you needed uh, or you wanted <laughs> wow. uh, so i enjoyed that one very much but yeah the block 30 okay. is, is a great airplane as well I don't think those words have ever left my lips in yeah. my <laughs> career, and I won't. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I better leave it at that. Yeah. All right. So I know you're still working through the variants, but yep. like a CJ, is that necessarily a particular aircraft, or is it just if you slap some things on it, that's what you call it? Help me understand that. Okay. So the Block 3032 was the F-16C. 
Okay. And then it became the F-16C Plus and all these things uh, as the upgrades sure. came in to retrofit it, much like you said of the Hornet. The Block 40 uh, became the F-16CG. What did G mean? Any? That's a good question. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but, but what was different about it, it was, it was wired for uh, doing uh, night terrain following radar, what we call lantern, low right. altitude navigation targeting infrared. Nice. And you could fly basically hands off down to about 50 feet off the ground at night, and it would keep you from hitting the ground. Uh, it was, you know, no thanks. I don't want to try yeah, I know. Everybody, everybody was deathly afraid of it, especially coming, you know, all the old heads who had been flying day VFR light airplanes. They were right. like, I don't want to touch that. But it worked really, really well. And then the F 16 CJ, which is what you brought up, was the Block 50 52, and that was wired to do suppression of enemy air defenses i.e. shooting radars and shooting uh, surface-to-air missiles and, and that, that kind of uh, you know, mission. Okay. So those letters got attached to those blocks as well, but amongst operators, nobody really uses that. Okay. I mean, it's, it's block 40, block 50, and everybody knows what the 40 does or what the gotcha. 50 does. But within a wing or a squadron, would you have a mix or would you be one or the other? Uh, back in the day... There were some wings that were mixed, mm -hmm. but that was unusual. Okay. Usually there were straight 40s, you know, a wing of 40s or a wing of 50s or, or, gotcha. or that, that sort of thing. Okay. And would an F-16 pilot understand how to do all those missions or would they specialize? In theory, yes. Uh, in practice, each wing would uh, concentrate on a certain a mission. Specialty. A specialty, yeah. if you will, yeah. Mm -hmm. And also depend, depended heavily on what theater they were uh, slated to go into. Okay. Yeah, for example, an F-18 pilot has to do all those things. But within a squadron, we might only have a handful of guys who do a slam ER mission or the Paveway 3 with the GBU-24. Right. And I'm guessing it's the same thing. You're not going to give it to your brand newest pilot, some of that no, stuff. No, you wouldn't. Right? But, it, you know, within the squadron, the Air Force tended to qualify everybody on that mission. Mm -hmm. uh, so it wasn't like, you know, a third of the squadron can do this or right. a third can do that. Now, you know, the experienced guys and the guys with more uh, hours – would definitely be better at it, sure. but they would train everybody to that level. Right. Yeah, there's no substitute for experience. Mm -hmm. All right, I keep derailing you. You're trying to keep That's the okay. uh, conversation on track. I keep uh, pulling yeah. us off. That's fine. Uh, I think we're still working. I think we made it to the 50s. What's after yep. that? All right, so after that, the Air Force created what they call the F-16 E and F. Really? And that is a Block 60. Wow. And that airplane was designed specially for the United Arab Emirates. Okay. The UAE. So they paid for the development? They did. All right. Are we going to get any benefit of it? There's talk of it. Okay. Uh, but this airplane has a monster engine, like 32,000 pounds of thrust. Um, <laughs> you know, the airplane has conformal tanks mm -hmm. uh, for long range. Uh, it has a synthetic aperture uh, radar. Yep. Um, integrated avionics, um, identifiers, uh, all the weapons that we've already talked about. This thing can carry any weapon, basically. Right. Um, and basically, this airplane was designed for their specifications. But a lot of a lot of the uh, research and development of the avionics and systems within this airplane are really in the F thirty five. And I believe Lockheed Martin used a lot of that research to bring about what the F thirty five. And in the F thirty five, everything's totally integrated. Mm -hmm. So much so that, you know, the pilot gets information in his cockpit and he doesn't really know or care where it came from right. because <laughs> he has true. the information. If he's got the SA, yes. then that's all good. That's right. And you said Lockheed Martin, before we rolled tape, we talked about that this once began life as the General Dynamics F-16. That is now correct. Lockheed Martin, not unlike the F-18 that began life as a McDonnell Douglas and now is Boeing. Right. All right. And then there's some other random variants floating around. There used to be an F-16N. Did you ever know yes, much about that? I, I do know, and that okay. was uh, that was the sports car. That's right of of the F sixteen. Uh, that was uh, bought by the by the Navy mm -hmm. and to use as an aggressor adversary aircraft. It was stripped of anything that had weight in it, even the gun, <laughs> and just they added some ballast to compensate for, for the that. Center of gravity calculation, yeah, absolutely. Right? Yep. And uh, I've heard it said this airplane was the razor blade Dang. because it it just. You know, you you could you could pull on the stick nine G's and it wouldn't slow down. I was born too late, except for that part. There is a great article out there. I think I can find it again. I'll 
refer to it in the show notes, but it's from gentlemen who flew it in that era and they speak fondly of it. And I think we've talked either here or on other shows I've been a guest on that they ended up pulling the wings off it. And some casual outsiders might think, oh, look, they abuse their toys. Let's not give them good airplanes. Well, guess what? They flew it the way it was meant to fly. Absolutely. And for the short period of time, while the wings were still attached, and uh, you know, figuratively speaking, mm-hmm. the training the students received must have been phenomenal. Yeah, I, mean, I don't think absolutely. there was anything like it anywhere. Absolutely. Okay. Great. Well, what other cats and dog variants are there of the F-16 out there? So I've, I've flown the F-16 I, Really? Uh, which is essentially, it's a two-seater only. Okay. And it's specially made for the Israeli Air Force. Okay. I've delivered about six or seven of them to the Israeli Air really? Force. From like Texas to Israel? Absolutely. Wow. And uh, <laughs> it's it's a pretty amazing airplane. It's more of a strike fighter, if you will. Okay. Uh, you know, there were systems in there that, uh, frankly, we had no idea what they were. Uh, <laughs> and this thing had warts and protrusions coming from every, every That's corner. That's how the customer wanted it. Absolutely. Okay. Enough uh, said, probably. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, the Israeli Air Force has been using it recently, mm-hmm. uh, striking uh, targets inside of uh, Syria. Right. And even though the Russians have brought in, you know, their the killer missiles, the S-300, that they say, you know, the, the Israelis just go in, they bomb things, and nobody sees them. So I, I haven't seen anything on the news about Israeli fighters being shot down. So, no. hmm. Well, actually, they, they got one shot down oh, by they? an SA-5. Oh, dear. Which is kind of unusual. Gammon, I don't want to say yeah, it was. That's, okay. that's like the space right. shuttle. But, yeah, that thing's yeah. huge. Okay. All right, so an F-16I. Mm-hmm. Uh, any other? Obviously, usually when aircraft are... What's the word I want? Not proliferated, but I guess that's it. To different countries, they'll mm-hmm. f- slap a letter on either the front or the back for the country. But any others that are relatively common? Well, probably in the last five to ten years, as the airplane basically proliferated, like you said, mm-hmm. last count, I think there's over like 4,300 of these airplanes made. fabricated and, and made wow. and, and, and flying all over the world, over 25 air forces, uh, so forth and so on. Air forces like Greece or Israel or uh, Oman or Pakistan, they get these airplanes, and it's almost like designer. You know, I want this kind of radar in it. I want this kind of uh, radar warning receiver in mm-hmm. it or this kind of expendables, uh, you know. So they're uh, ordering a la carte. They are. They are, and it's, <laughs> it's pretty, pretty cool. amazing yeah. as, as you fly those airplanes mm-hmm. and you go, oh, I didn't know that was in here or, or whatnot. So, right. yeah, it's, they're very, very – varied on okay. what they bring, depending sure. on what the customer wants and pays for. Okay. Well, there's one more variant that I can think of today. I'm going to put you on the spot here, the QF-16. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd rather forget that. <laughs> well, and, and I'll tell you, this also has a rough spot in my heart, if you will. I don't know a better expression for that. But the same 28 aircraft that the Navy ended up with 14 of, the Air Force ended up with 14 of, we had to compete with parts with the Air Force. And you always had the priority because it's your airplane. Mm -hmm. But then at some point, they started turning these into drones and blowing them up. And meanwhile, we can't keep our 14 flying in Fallon. And here go parts up in smoke. But yeah, they've turned, I understand, a handful of these into drones. Generally, they try not to shoot them down. But I guess every once in a while, they actually have destroyed a few. Is that true? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I I think that's a crime, too. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But, uh, you know, the F-16 with its fly-by-wire flight control system, it works very well for flying it by remote control, mm-hmm. uh, you know, because of the of the the complexity and also the manuals and how how the systems work. It's not you know uh, cables and pulleys or right. any of that. So remote control works really well. You would think you would have priority on parts to keep the airplane <laughs> flying, but the Air Force and, and like the Navy always want to test their missiles with telemetry and usually they don't put warheads on them exactly so that if they get close to the uh, to the drone the drone doesn't doesn't explode and they can reuse it right over and over again but as you said sometimes the missile is so good it just spears right. spears the drone and uh you know it it, it uh, downs it yeah uh, i've shot an amram uh doing that at uh, at an f4 drone mm-hmm. um and f4s were what they used full scale right. drones uh, up QF until force. recently mm-hmm. qf4s so, you know, no matter what the engineers tell you that the missile can and can't do, it's really important to go out there and try it. That's right. Because what works uh, on a computer program or mm-hmm. simulation, as you know, doesn't always work in real, real life, real world. And then you also get to tweak 
your weapons launch zone and envelopes off the testing data so that it allows you to train in a manner that's exactly how you're going to fight. There you go. So you don't you don't have this overly achieving thought that you know. Well, this missile, I just I just shoot it and it shoots everything. Right. Down. So that's right. It's got. Right. A, it doesn't have a probability of kill of one. That's it's what I was usually, just about to say. It's usually point. <laughs> it's eight, close. Point. But yeah. Sometimes relatively. better than others, mm-hmm. depending on the parameters. Right. Uh, but yeah. So anyway, it's very important because we're one of the few uh, air forces in the world. And, and when I say Air Forces, I mean Air Forces, I right. Navy, Marine Corps, sure. that actually goes out and tests these things. Mm-hmm. And that feedback comes back in to provide better training and uh, better performance. Right. All right. Let's move on then to something about the actual design of the aircraft, as we've put it before. Why does it look the way it does? And I would say to lead into that, when you are looking head on at an F-16, it's very difficult to see. Because the largest part of it is that engine, and it's almost like they put some skin around the engine, attach some wings and a tail, and that's about it. But what else can you tell us about the shape of the F-16? Yes, you're absolutely correct. Uh, and we always said, if you were inside of two miles from an adversary, just point at him. Because that was the, once you it's did like a that, cloaking device. it was practically <laughs> impossible for them to see you. By the uh-huh. time they saw you, you've already launched... Uh, some kind of weapon at them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, that is, you know, in a visual arena, it's a great strength to be small and, and be difficult to, to, to be seen as well. Mm-hmm. Legend has it that the F-16 uh, was designed basically from the requirements of, you mentioned the, the gentleman before, mm-hmm. Boyd, yep. Colonel Boyd, and other pilots, and they met with a bunch of engineers uh, from General Dynamics in the bar. They didn't really say this is what we want it to look like. Mm-hmm. They just said... This is what we want this airplane to do. And they basically said, we want this airplane to outperform anything out there. And really, the thing that they wanted to ensure was that the Soviet-built uh, MiG-21 fish bed to us, right. that this airplane would uh, outperform it in every facet of, of flight. And that was because what we learned in Vietnam, that our more powerful, heavier fighters really had a, a difficult time when they were dogfighting these airplanes because they were very nimble, very fast, very small, and we wanted something that could compete with that and outperform it. So those were kind of the, the, the initial requirements that were given. If you look at it, this and the YF-17 were the two first airplanes that incorporated fly-by-wire into their flight control systems. That reduced weight and size. So it allowed you to make the airplane much smaller, much sleeker, because you didn't have all these bells and pulleys and right. all these crazy things that basically uh, conventional fighters up to, the, to that day had. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that made it, made it exactly as you said. If you look at the F-16, it's basically a cylinder where the engine is, mm-hmm. and then you can basically put two wings on it, a vertical <laughs> tail, two small <laughs> tails in the back, a little bubble canopy in front for someone to sit. For someone to sit, <laughs> and that's it. Uh, so, yeah. if it's pointing at you, if it's going away from you, it's practically invisible. Right. Uh, once it turns, you can see plan form. Then you can see sure. obviously a little more. But uh, so that's kind of what it is. But it's basically a single seat with a high visibility bubble canopy, mm-hmm. a single engine, single tail, side stick, front line fighter, and uh, it's, it is truly awesome to fly. And when you sit in it. I'd say about 75% to 80% of the airplane is behind you. Yes. So you have this feeling that you're at the end of a pencil and you're flying a magic carpet. You're being propelled through space. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep, I agree with that. I still remember fondly my first few flights because after flying the same airplane for over 20 years, to get in that where you reclined, like you said, with a yes. side stick, yes. and the performance is amazing, as we'll get to in a moment. It really is incredible. And one other thing that you have, which is an advantage most of the time, is that you don't have the canopy bow. So in other words, you have a one-piece canopy that comes down, True. and so you don't have the bow like we have in an F-18, also they have 14, and mm-hmm. arguably most other fighters. Yes. And so you lose the rearview mirrors, and you lose, in a sense, kind of a reference sometimes, mm-hmm. but... Boy, it does make you feel like you're on that magic carpet. I totally agree with that. It does, yeah. <laughs> the the uh, canopy bow on the F-16 is behind you. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> and and you you can use it somewhat for de- defensive uh, basic fighter maneuvers. Like a reference uh, point. As a reference. Mm-hmm. But we're basically using, we use the glare shield and the HUD, right. which is right in front of you as, right. as a reference. Yep, I remember that. All right. I would also add on the physical appearance of it that the wings being so thin – 
did not allow the landing gear to be placed in the wings. So you end up with a relatively narrow set of main gear yes. and also very small because the Air Force doesn't need the big beefy stuff that I'm used to. Correct. And so to me, without a lot of experience, it felt a little squirrely at times with some crosswind. And but I, you know, I guess it worked okay. Did you ever have any trouble with that? Or uh, well, I will say it's probably the most difficult airplane I've ever had to land. Oh wow! And, okay, and I'll tell you why. The main flight of the F-16 back in the '70s was supposed to be a high-speed taxi, but the flight control uh, uh, system was not set correctly. Okay, it was a little too sensitive for what it would eventually need. So the uh, test pilot who was doing a high-speed taxi ended up taking off. And <laughs> I think I've to, seen, there's video of yes, this, Yes, there's right? a video yeah, of it, okay. absolutely. It is a blue, a red, white, and blue painted F-16. Uh-huh. Uh, so that, was, that tells you something. <laughs> and this is what it tells you. If you ever sit at the end of the runway and you, and you see an F-16 come by and land, it's flight controls, i.e. it's uh, horizontal stabilizers, it's flapperons because mm-hmm. the flaps and the ailerons are together, right. are basically moving at about two to three times per second continuously as you come in to land. The airplane doesn't want to land. The airplane wants to fly. <laughs> so you can come in on the same approach 60 different times, same airspeed, same uh, angle of attack, same everything, and you'll get a totally different landing every time. And you just never know. <laughs> mm-hmm. It is a very, very squirrely airplane to land. Right. And then you have the crosswinds to deal with. Now, sure. some F-16s had drag chutes, I believe, they early do. on. Yeah, they and sure And then do. all of them have what I would just call a hook. Yes. But really for you, is almost an emergency measure because you it have is. those long field... Bar- what do you guys call them? Cables or barriers? We call or- them, uh, yeah, we call them either approach end barriers, barriers or departure yeah. end barriers, okay. but they are cables. Right. And when you lower the hook... You're doing that as a, like an emergency. I need to grab something and stop. Sure, it's absolutely. Not just, oh, I lowered it, but wait, I'll change my mind and raise it. Sure. Right. Yeah, you can do that. Uh, but you know, mainly you, you would drop the hook if you needed to do an approach end or departure end barrier mm-hmm. engagement. And the reasons for those things would be uh, you lost your brakes on landing, right? Or you uh, you know you lost your engine and you were past you know the the stopping distance that you need, you just drop the hook and it you right. catch the departure end. Right. A lot of times, if you know if one of your gear wouldn't come down or if you had battle damage, you would come in and do an, an approach end arrestment because the airplane would be unstable or, right. or something like that, and you didn't really want to roll down the runway and wait till it, it right. flipped on its back or something. The like transition that. from flying to taxiing is always tenuous. So it when is. you have any kind of problem, like you stated, then you just want to basically nip that in the bud by saying, I'm just going to grab this barrier and it's going to pull me to a stop. Very true. Okay. Well, next let's move on to the armament and maybe it's easier to say what it doesn't carry. Uh, You can speak in general terms if you'd like, but suffice to say it pretty much carries any air to air missile with the exception of the Phoenix, which is gone anyway. And just about any air to surface munition. Is that effectively true? Uh, Just about there's a, what they call a a AGM uh, 130. It's like a glide bomb. I think, I think it's the size of an F 16. We don't carry that. (laughs) All right. But Uh, you do carry like a JSAO. We do. AGM-154. We do. Okay. And we but, also carry uh, the Paveway 3 right. GBU-24, which, is which are 2,000-pound type I munitions. I think with all the kit, it's almost 2,400. Yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. All right. Absolutely. So, so yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. It also carries, you know, uh, harm missiles, mm-hmm. anti-radiation missiles. Uh, those are fairly large as well. Yeah, 800-pound uh, missile. Absolutely. And then also uh, harpoon missiles, anti-ship. Really? It's, okay. It's capable. Uh Air forces like uh, Greece carry it because they have a lot of maritime, sure. uh, uh, you know, island uh, type type operations. Uh, so you know that sort of stuff, and then you know all kinds of laser guided weapons, sure. uh, the Paveway two and three. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the newest stuff that they carry is the JDAM, right? the GPS guided weapons, right? And they can carry anything from a five hundred to a thousand to a two thousand pound, uh, you know, a Mark Mark series body with right. with that guidance kit, and then finally. Uh, one thing that, that the F-16 carries that you know, some people may not know is the Python 4 and Python 5, Ooh. which is an Israeli missile. Really? And the Chileans fly it, okay. fly with it, and the Israelis fly with it. And All I right. believe even the Greeks might have been able to get that as well. Okay. And that's, uh, that missile is uh, it's pretty amazing. Yes. Uh, it'll cut an airplane in half. Yikes. And it doesn't go to the engine. It goes to the fore edge of the 
Oh, the airplane. Oh, I think we should talk about this on another episode. But I think I heard something about this because in a certain war, pilots were getting shot down. They were just running to the other airplane and jumping in and going again. Right. And so the other side said, well, forget taking out the aircraft. We need to take out the pilot. Yeah, that's diabolical. Yeah. But it is diabolical. <laughs> but uh, I guess they, that's uh, war. They, right. uh, they want to survive. So Yeah. All right. Obviously, all your general purpose munitions, Mark 80 series. Absolutely. Bombs. How about rockets? You guys do rockets? Uh, we can carry them. Can um, but and don't we do we do shoot them? Oh, okay. uh, but it's mainly two point uh, two point seven five, right? Uh, not not the four inch Zuni that, five inch. Uh, or five inch, yep. sorry that uh, that the naval aviation tends to carry, mm-hmm. uh, and they're mainly used for marking. Okay, yep. How about Slam ER? Slam ER. Uh, if you don't know what it is, you probably don't. <laughs> I I've I've heard it not in the Air Force. Okay, yeah. Now it's... some of our 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 partners, and there's a lot of testing that's going sure. on that. You know, if you talk to somebody who works in the, in Eglin Air Force Base and does all the weapons testing, mm-hmm. it would say, "Yeah, I've, you know, I've done this, I've done that." Now, whether the Air Force decides to right. to purchase it or not, that's a different thing. Okay. And what I was going to bring up is is uh, a new munition that, that that we were testing as I was as I walked out the door two years ago. It's called the small diameter bomb. Yep. And it's uh, basically like a I don't know, fifty pound looking small <laughs> mul- practice bomb. You can basically, you know, with the JDAM uh, GPS guided guidance kit, mm-hmm. basically launch that thing 50, 60 miles, and it'll hit a moving vehicle. That's amazing. So yeah. it's, you know, low low yield, right. but very accurate. Hey, and you don't need a lot of yield Absolutely. if it's accurate. So yep, we actually have talked about the small diameter bomb mm-hmm. on the show before. Okay, good. How about mines? Anything for inner uh, shipping well, and stuff? you know, one thing we haven't talked about is uh, cluster bomb units. Oh, yeah? CBU. Okay. Uh, we carry basically anything that... that that's a CBU. Yeah. And some of those CBUs have mine bomblets. Oh. Basically, you drop it. Oh, land-based Absolutely. mines. Yeah. Yeah, I no, was thinking sea-based, but yeah. No, not so much sea-based, but okay. land-based. Mm-hmm. Uh, that They also have what they call the, the combined munitions, CBU-87, CBU-89. And that is a really nasty munition because the little bomblets that come out, depending on what target they hit, they either penetrate like an armor piercing or they frag, i.e. they blow up. <laughs> If it's a soft target to yeah. cause max max destruction, so it it's kind of a, a designer weapon. You just drop it and it finds a target, and when it hits it, it decides whether oh well, that was hard, so I'm going to penetrate it, or oh, that was soft, I'm just going to frag it. Scary. So cr- crazy stuff. For Skynet. Sure. Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Maverick. Maverick, yes, yep. for anti armor uh, okay. as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, uh, all the models basically. Okay. I've shot uh, Bs and Ds and Gs. Okay. And they're probably up to Ks or Ls I, now. I don't know. There's yeah. laser guided ones. There's yep. I, uh, infrared ones. Mm-hmm. There are TV guided ones. Yep. There's all all the gamut. You know? For sure. All right. Well, let's just summarize by saying it can carry just about anything that's made, especially as they keep building these F-16s. It's so much easier these days to just program what you want. You know, absolutely. It's a, a and customer demand. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, you know, modern fighters are just like computers. You, if you want more capability, you change the software and you write some code and you have that capability. Awesome. All right, let's talk performance. And I will tell you that I can validate some of this. We had limitations with our older aircraft that we couldn't go above the mid 30s just because we didn't want to risk any pressurization problems. But speed, altitude, G's, okay. what do you got for us? Okay, so uh, it's a Mach 2.05 uh, rated airplane. Okay. Uh, I've been up to about 1.8 uh, myself. It's rated up to 50,000 feet. I've heard it said that some people have gone on above that. Not I've me, seen though. pictures above that. Yeah, not me though. Yeah, okay. Um, and uh, it's uh, it's a nine G rated airplane. Also, I've I've seen ten point three in my HUD before. Ouch. Uh, and yes, did it you does. go talk to maintenance squadron? Oh, after absolutely. That? Yeah. <laughs> but again, you know, it, it's it's not anything the pilot selects. Uh, it it just happened. You know, either right. it hit a burble, it was right. right on the edge, whatever. So yeah, it's it's uh, very very demanding on the body. Oh yes. I flew it till I was uh, fifty two years old. And I'm here to tell you that, <laughs> although I love the airplane, <laughs> my neck and my back have never felt better. It gets painful. Yes, yes. never felt better now that you're no longer flying Correct. it. Correct. T-Day, I might have one thing then about the F-16 that I've done that you haven't. I've seen 1.93. Ah, but to be fair, that was a slick sure. Block 15A. Sure. Absolutely. And I was starting up high, and I was just the high, fast flyer on the Red Air. You bet. And I looked in, and I thought, holy smokes, this is amazing. Yeah. And the next thing I knew, I was in the middle of the fighters, and my fuel was about 1.8. <laughs> 
And after getting the cushion out of the place that it had retreated to, yeah. I limped back and landed with like a 1.2 from 100 miles away because the thing is just so efficient. You so can you were fat. cruise in that thing. Yeah, I was fine. <laughs> but compared to my previous 3,000 hours right. where you never land below 2,000, sure. to land with 1,000 pounds in the yes. F-16 was just not normal. So, so yeah, you're right. Amazing. I've never been mock number that high, but I have been at 789 knots on the deck. Wow. Okay, I don't think I saw that. That's pretty good. <laughs> Red line was 800. Uh, geez, Louise. <laughs> I did see the 9Gs. I did mm -hmm. see, like I said, about 30 or 40. But w there was a picture at Top Gun on the wall, and it was four different pictures, actually. Uh -huh. And one was the HUD at 9G. One was the HUD at something like what you just said for yep. speed. One was the HUD at 63. 5,000 feet, and one was the HUD at, I want to say, Mach 2.05. Yes. And it was one of the air crew from the F-16N days uh -huh. who was yep. basically making the case of, hey, Top Gun, make sure you have the right adversary aircraft because you can't beat this training. And we all looked at that and said, yeah, that's great, but we can't do that anymore. So, yeah, yeah the thing is a rocket ship. It is impressive. All right. How about strengths and weaknesses, if you're willing to say? Usually sure. on this part of the show, everybody's happy to tell about the strengths. There's not yeah. too many weaknesses. But considering what it was designed to do and what it does and your flight experience in it, let's start with the strengths, T-Day. What, what, what can you tell us? All right. So uh, I, I would say that amongst, amongst the strengths, uh, it's really the versatility to accomplish any modern fighter mission with the most relative economy of any present-day fighter. I mean, it is... When you look at every other fighter, just, just having one engine alone, it's pretty cheap right. compared to those you know, two massive engines uh, just on fuel consumption, maintenance, oh, all yes. that stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's a very economical fighter for the capability that it brings. You add to that its ability to do air-to-air -air and air-to-ground, and in one platform, you basically have everything you need. That's right. And you see a lot of uh, foreign air forces going that way because they have limited resources, limited funds, and by getting that single platform, now they're covered well, with all their uh, air, you know, defense mm -hmm. needs, if you will, from mm -hmm. their fighter aircraft. And like, like we talked about before, it is uh, the most numerous Western-built fighters still in production. Amazing. Uh, so we said, you know, in excess of 4,200 or 4,300 still, um, you know, they have been built and delivered. And it was one of the first airplanes that you were able to basically remove whole uh, compartment systems. In other words, if your flight control system had a problem, you basically opened up a panel, pulled out a box that was your flight control uh, computer, you put in the new box, you connected the plug-in, <laughs> you closed it, and you went. There you so go. So maintenance was very advanced, mm -hmm. and every time we landed, you know, our uh, our crew chiefs, i.e. our maintenance uh, guys that ran, like you would call uh, plane, plane captain. captains, yep. right? Yep. They would basically just plug in a, a laptop to it and go, oh, okay, yeah, I got to do this, I got to do that. And it would just diagnose the whole airplane. That's so right. it was kind of the beginning of the computerized uh, yeah. maintenance world, and it just makes things so much easier to keep it in the air and to turn it when you need to. That's right. So those are those are some pretty, pretty big strengths that sometimes as operators we don't really uh, uh, focus on because we're just happy to fly the thing. That's right. right. So for sure – those, those would be the, probably the two biggest ones. Then the other one that we've already uh, alluded to and talked about is its small size. Mm -hmm. Now, the advantage of that is in, in, within a visual arena, it is very difficult to see. That's right. So it makes it very, very lethal, as you know, lose sight, lose fight, oh, right? Yes. Uh, so um, so that's, a, that's a great strength of it. Additionally, it is small, like we talked about. It is very thin. It's got that big tube of the engine and these little wings, little things attached to it. Well, guess what? It's got a pretty small radar cross-section as well. Oh, so go. even the radars, uh, both air-to-air -air and air-to-ground, have a difficult time picking it up as compared to other conventional mm. fighters. You said air-to-ground. Did you mean surface-to-air? Surface-to-air, okay. yeah, yeah, sorry. No problem. I don't absolutely. mean to point out an error. No, but I you're absolutely sure. correct okay. on that. Okay. Yeah. So those are some of its strengths. Um, and then finally, its ability to gain, sustain, and regain energy. It's, you Agreed. know, previous... <laughs> I mean, up until the F-22, it's, it's unmatched. Yeah. I mean, uh, I remember uh, we had a Hornet exchange pilot uh, from the Navy in our squadron uh, when I was flying out of Hill Air Force Base. And we were in uh, Saudi Arabia, and we had gone over to, uh, to Bahrain. And we were at the officer's club, and he, he saw one of his buddies who was out off the carrier in the Gulf, and they were, they were talking. And we were have, you know, having a, a beverage, and I'm hearing them talk. And his buddy goes, hey, what's... What's, what's the Viper like? 
and uh, <laughs> my my buddy, his name was Oscar Myers. He goes, it's a razor blade. <laughs> he goes, you know, in the Hornet, you get slow, and then you're slow. Oh, yeah. He says, this thing, you get down to 250 knots, you just plug in the afterburner, three, four seconds later, you're up about 350, and then it just keeps going. Yeah. So... So I was going, hmm, I'll remember that. I, I, I've never forgotten that, that, that term. <laughs> razor blade, I like so it. So those, those are all the advantages that, that come to mind okay. that, that I you know, uh, had experience with. All right. And now I'm sure you probably want to see or you want to hear what do I think are some of the disadvantages. <laughs> well, weaknesses, let's, let's yeah. call them, if there well, are. Well, you know, everything has advantages Absolutely. and disadvantages. Absolutely. So um, probably the first one for me is that, you know, it has this this uncanny performance and ability to maintain it and sustain it, but it's not very tolerant of the human of the human body. Right. So, it it, it is so good that it oftentimes exceeds your ability to stay awake. That's right. What do I mean by that? If you've ta- you've talked about G's and how G- the physiology of G's on the body, and if you're not ready for it. I mean, you can just snap nine G's. If you're you're if you are above four f- between four hundred and five hundred knots, and you snap that stick back, it'll give you nine G's. Mm-hmm. And if you're not ready for that, you'll take a nap, <laughs> and that can be disastrous. Yes, uh, That's catastrophic. Been mm-hmm. uh, and we've had a lot of loss of pilots and airplanes uh, due to that. What we call G induced loss of consciousness right. or G lock. Yep. Uh, so that, you know, its strength can be a weakness if you're not ready for it. So mm-hmm. that's probably the biggest thing that everybody kind of fears the F-16 when they're flying it. And that is, a, uh, I would say, uh, a huge focus of the training of that aircraft with the operator is you have to be ready for this. Mm-hmm. You have to have your body in, 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 in constant tension when you're going to do that. And before you think about pulling back on the stick, you better be constraining your blood vessels and grunting and getting right. ready for it because it's, it's man. You know, I always tell people, up to seven Gs, you know, if you do it all, all the time, yeah. your body adjusts, eh, you grunt spin, a little, yeah, whatever, not a big deal. From seven to nine, it is, it is E to the X. <laughs> it's exponential. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's that. Yeah. Then the other thing, uh, I think, um, you know, due to its relative small size, it's always been limited on the amount of weapons that it can carry. Mm-hmm. Uh, but as technology has improved, and obviously accuracy has improved, you know, one weapon, one target, that has somewhat diminished. Yeah. But, you know, it only has nine weapon stations. And uh, most of the time, you can only carry a single weapon on that. Although, you know, now with advancements, right. you got different, different types of suspension systems right. to help you with that. And then finally, uh, probably the biggest one that guys will tell you who never fly it and are used to two engines, so it only has one engine. That's right. Uh, and I don't think I'd want to fly that airplane over the ocean all the time either. <laughs> uh, so I understand the two-engine yeah. mentality of, of the U.S. Navy and the Marine Corps. Yeah. It makes sense to me, right? You yeah. want to have that other one to take you home or, or take you where you can put it down. And, uh, you know, the, sing- the single-engine mentality, it does make some things very simple. It either works or it doesn't. That's right. Uh, so there's no, there's no. Well, can I make it? You know, whatever. Yeah. And I can attest that when it quits, it quits. I've, <laughs> I've ejected out of an F-16. You have. I have. Oh, yes. I did not uh, know. So that. I have one more uh, takeoff than landing. Oh dear. It. Well, I that's do. not ideal, but that is yeah. reality, right? Okay. Absolutely. And uh, you know, um, um, my, I tried to recover into an emergency airfield. Basically, a first stage fan blade came off the jet and seized the engine. Okay. Well, that's not the pilot's fault. No, no, <laughs> it wasn't. Um, and. Uh, the jet hit three miles short of the runway, and I was like seven miles away. So, okay. uh, but the seat works, which is well, which is good. I'm glad to hear that. Otherwise, we might not be having this conversation. Yeah, you bet. I'm glad too. Well, T-Day, I would agree with all that. I know that. Back to your point on the strengths. When I started flying the F-16, I had over 3,000 hours in the F-18. A lot of that was dogfighting, and I had to relearn how to dogfight because in an F-18, if you got low and slow on the deck you're going to just knock it off. And it takes you the next two minutes to get your speed back as you climb back up for the next one. In the F-16, if I could do it based on what my opponent was doing, ease off the stick for a few seconds, and boom, back, like you said, to 350, and then you can go up again. And that was memorable. And until someone showed me that when I was starting to fight it, because I would just fight it the way I was used to. Sure. And they said, no, no, you can't do that. Um, but to that point, 
A weakness, I would argue, to add to that, and you probably, I guess you never flew the F-18, obviously. I did not. You could pull back on the F-18 and get virtually unlimited AOA. Correct. With the F-16, you could not. And I understand that that was due to, if you did, you would put yourself in a position where aerodynamically you're in real trouble. And you're going to fall out of the sky in a manner that you cannot recover from. So... Again, learning how to be a femme, I would get over the top in a roller, and it's hard to describe this without our hands, you know, shooting each other down, but a roller is kind of a vertical thing where you just are chasing each other through the sky vertically, Mm -hmm. and I'd get to the top, and if you were at the bottom, and I thought, oh, I can shoot him, and I would pull, and I'd want to break that stick off, and it wouldn't go anymore. I'm like, come on. All I need is to point at you, and it would not give it to me. In the F-16, you did that the other way. When you're at the bottom and he's the top, then you point out. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> because you know he can't do it. Because anything. he's got nothing yeah. up here. Yep. No, that's true. So it's almost 180 out. Yeah. We're in the Hornet. I know what you mean. You get yeah. on your back and you can just go. You just walk. squat the thing. Absolutely. And of course, with the joint helmet and uh, all aspect mm-hmm. weapons and everything else, that takes the chivalry out of it anyway, as far as if it's just real yes. quarter guns and sport, missiles. But sport BFM is That's dead. right. That's right. Uh, but I... Yeah, I had forgotten that it has nine weapon stations. It's the same thing we have on the Legacy Hornet. Super Hornet has 11. Yep. Yep. And yeah, I, I think another possible weakness could be the fuel capacity, arguably. I mean, mm. what is it, about 7,600 internally? Uh, let me think. I know it's been a little while, but yeah. it's not that much. Yeah, that's about right, because uh, okay. with, a, with a centerline tank, you'd get up in the low 9,000s. So. Right. And yeah. so a regular Hornet internal was about ten. Sure. And but again, it's a different aircraft. Right. And uh, and you got two two things that need to be fed. So right. Yeah. Right. So, Actually, you know, it was really interesting when we would fight F-15s. Mm-hmm. Basically, they just doubled our. I mean, their fuel was double ours, <laughs> and it just worked that way. Mm-hmm. You know, they had two, and we had one, and the same engine they, too, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, some were. Some. Okay. They don't have GEs. Okay. Uh, but. You know, if they needed 20,000 pounds, we needed 10. So, it, it, I mean, it was almost to, to a T. It was, it was uncanny. That All way. right. That's amazing. The, um, you're right about the AOA, uh, which, which is a difference. And, and the airplane doesn't fly like any other airplane that I know, that, I, that, that I've fought against. And as the airplane gets slow, like you said, your AOA just goes away. Right. So you have to do other things. Sure. Um, you have to keep energy. You have to use the vertical. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you know, it's like anything. You know where your strengths are, and that's, that's right. where you want to fight. That's you don't right. want to fight in the other guy's strengths. That's right. And absolutely, you know, we always were very, uh, very careful of, of the Hornet AOA. And we always said, okay, he's going he's gonna to try to point at you. Don't, don't cast your energy <laughs> away because right. then he owns you. And if you can at least deny him when he does that yes. first maneuver to get slow, then you should be in good shape. And I have certainly lived that myself. You bet. All right, dude, we're almost at the end here. Notoriety. Where would the viewer, and with over 4,000, I would hope the listener, not the viewer, would know where they've seen this thing. It's everywhere. And like you said, many countries. But let's just talk Hollywood. Where have we seen this thing <laughs> on TV or in the movies? Yeah, I'd rather or not but uh, <laughs> well, all right let fine. me let me let me start with something that that i think is 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 momentous and, and worth remembering okay but the f-16 had its first air-to-air kill in 1981 in april of 1981 when a uh israeli f-16 shot down a syrian mi-8 helicopter with its gun nice uh shortly thereafter those airplanes that you were flying at fallon uh-huh um their sister airplanes went to the Israeli Air Force. Okay. And they used them to bomb the Iraqi reactor. That's right. About 17 kilometers southeast of Baghdad, and hence denying Saddam Hussein the development of a, of a nuclear weapon. Yeah. Um, and they flew, I want to say, like 50 feet for like an hour. Absolutely. Oh, my gosh. And I then, want to find that article again. And then they did 60-degree pops. Mm-hmm. Dang. And dumped 2,000-pound dump bombs <laughs> on it. Okay. So that, that's pretty uh, pretty. Uh, All right, pretty but that's awesome. not Hollywood now. Come on now. No, that's not Hollywood. <laughs> one more. I have to give you one more before we get to Hollywood, and then you'll know why I'm, I'm doing uh, this. Um, so during the Lebanon War, uh-huh. the Israeli Air Force, and this was in, uh, um, ooh, let me see, oh, 1982, actually. They um, engaged in a three-day air war uh, with the Syrian Air Force, and in three days they shot down 44 uh, airplanes, Syrian airplanes. Wow. To how many losses? Uh, I think they had like five. Okay. That's still and nine most, to one. And most of those were surface to air. Oh, okay. Missiles, kills, yeah, yeah, yeah. SA-3s at the time. Okay. Uh, so, you know, pretty awesome record to start out with. For sure. Uh, and again, it was designed as a dogfighter, so 
it, it makes sense that that's how it, it performed. Now we'll move on to uh, the stuff you're asking me about. Uh, wait, one more thing. One more thing. <laughs> the Viper was the first airplane to ever down another airplane with an uh, AIM-120 AMRAAM. Oh, that's right. And it was done by a Captain Gary Nordo North. Okay. Who later would become General Nordo North, Commander uh, of Pacific Air Forces. Wow. But he shot down a MiG-25 over Iraq uh, with an F-16D, of all things, hmm. on 27 December 1992. Uh, while he was enforcing the no-fly that's right no fly operation uh, zone, southern watch or northern southern watch, watch yep. uh, when when they uh, right after the gulf war yep. all right and finally we'll get to uh what you've been waiting for <laughs> which i'd rather not talk about but i have the data so i will i will cover it uh bottom line is you know i think the u.s navy has always been a lot better for uh, public relations <laughs> as as uh, the movie top gun will attest to it uh, -huh. uh but uh the uh, the F-16 has appeared in a number of, uh, of uh, films, which I consider B-movies at best. Uh, first one was uh, Blue Thunder in 1983. Okay. Then Iron Eagle in 1986. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that movie, man. <laughs> then Iron Eagle 2, just in case you didn't get enough yeah, of the first that's one, right. in 1988. Then uh, Afterburn in 1992. Tactical Assault in 1998. Atomic Rain in 1999. Never heard of that. Me either. Okay. X-Men 2 in Ooh. 2003. All right. Uh, Eagle Eye in 2008. Okay. Transformers Last Night hmm. in 2017. And the exception to all these B-movies would be Top Gun, 1986. It's in there for about 0.7 seconds. Wait, what? When? It's in there. You got you to gotta look for all it. All right. Where? In the beginning? No. It's about, it's about halfway through. Okay. I will. I will. Uh, I will look it up and I will. I'll shoot you okay. the email. All right. Well, we'll make that a quiz for the listeners to see you if they bet. can find it and and let us know. But that's right. the exception of the of the B movie. Okay. Well, that is quite the list to belong to. And yes, we have railed on Iron Eagle on this show <sighs> before. I will tell you when I was. 12 years old and thinking about this as a career. I loved it. Sure. And then I watched it about a year ago and I thought, oh my gosh, how did I like this movie? But I didn't know what I know now. So you bet. Uh, yeah, Doug McMasters or whatever his name mm -hmm. was, he saved his dad. I mean, come on, what's not to love about it? <laughs> anyway. All right. Well, there's some other notoriety of the F-16. You know this, but I didn't really set you up for asking it. And that is the Thunderbirds fly it yes, and do. have for a long time. Yes. And it is very well proliferated, as we have mentioned on the show, uh, on this episode. Mm -hmm. And so, yep, it is, again, arguably one of the most proliferated, one of the most prolific fighters out there. All right, dude. Well, gosh, uh, you've already told us some stories. Any other quick good sea stories you want to share with us before we uh, get you out of here? Uh, well, <laughs> No, I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> I think it's gone pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> well, we better quit while we're ahead, huh? All right. Well, uh, if you're willing to say, any ordnance expended in anger? Uh, yeah. So I, uh, I, I dropped some weapons in Iraq. Okay. Um, I uh, took out a, a mortar and its team. Uh, okay. They were uh, shooting into the green zone, which was the, the diplomatic area. Around of, Baghdad. Uh, of mm -hmm. Baghdad. Mm -hmm. You know, and then mainly uh, just a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of training. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of ordnance, teaching students, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. All right. Do you ever get to dogfight a Tomcat? No. Oh, never too bad. Did. Okay. Never did. But F eighteen, F fifteen, yes, correct. F twenty two. F twenty two. Yes. Oh, good. Okay. Yes. All right. And then you already talked about some of the others. I think yeah. we went over that. Mirage two thousand. Nice. Mig twenty nine. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Germany or somewhere. Peru. Peru. Yeah, they have. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. All right, dude. Well, golly, we should go on and on. This might be one I allow to go a little longer than the normal one hour because this is such good stuff, or we'll break it into two episodes. But either way, T-Day, thank you for your time tonight to record this. Thanks for your 29 years of service. Thank you for knowing when to pull the handle so you could be here for your family and for us. <laughs> and Gee, I don't know what else to say or other accolades to give you, but man, 4,000 hours, and you've really done it all. And you have kept after me. You reached out, I don't know if I said this earlier, but you reached out to me early on in my show history here almost a year ago, mm -hmm. and we finally found a way to connect, and I'm glad we did. So thank you for all of that on behalf of the Fighter Pilot Podcast and our listeners. You're welcome, and it's uh, thank you for having me. You bet. 
All right. Well, before we let you go, we always ask what the future holds. Uh, it sounds like the credits are rolling on your movie. I mean, you're flying triple sevens for a big airline. You're uh, thinking fondly about your 29 years of service. You're doing great in Arizona. Anything in the future that we need to know about? Uh, no, not really. I mean, <laughs> okay. uh, I'm just, I'm just kind of uh, enjoying. You know, it's been two years since I've flown the airplane. Uh-huh. Uh, I do miss it. Yeah, I do miss the guys in the uh, in the squadron. I agree with that. Yeah, uh, for sure. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I, the longer it goes, you know, when people used to ask me, well, what do you, well, I'm in the air force or I fly an F-16, everybody would go, wow. And I used to say, yeah, it's okay. You know, it's, it's not a big deal. And, and the longer that goes that I'm not doing it, I'm really beginning to understand how really great it was mm-hmm. and how how lucky I was, I guess, yeah. is, is what I want to say. Well, so it's funny you say that, T-Day, because that reaction, which is a part ego stroke, I will confess, but it's also just who doesn't like to be revered for what they do? And so that's part of the reason I started this show. And it helps me to still feel that way, but it also helps us share these things. I mean, not everybody would have a chance to know your story short of you writing a book. So sure. now they get to hear it. And so we, again, thank you for that. All right, before we let you go, uh, Mike Tory Day. T day, I'm guessing I can figure this out. But uh, what, what's the deal with the call sign, and where did it come about, and and did you ever have a chance of earning anything better? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you know, I I know you guys have had a show on call signs, and, and we did, uh, and I did listen to it, and the Air Force pretty much handles it the same way as the, as the Navy and the Marines. Well, hold on. Let me interrupt you because yeah. on this show we have at times accused you guys of giving yourselves those cool call signs. So are you? No? Negative. Okay. All right. No. All right. No, no, so not we'll, at all. We'll put that, that to bed. That, anyway. that, that would be sacrilege. Okay. Please continue. <laughs> all right. So um, as you've mentioned, you know, uh, they are given for various various feats uh, <laughs> or, or, or not. <laughs> right. um, and uh, with me, I was very, very lucky that I never got caught doing anything really, really bad. Well put. Um, uh, which, you know, uh, that, that's always good when you can get by that way. Uh, so most people, as, as you notice, my last name is rather difficult to pronounce. It's, uh, you know, uh, starts with a T and it has a lot of, a lot of double R's and stuff in it. Mm-hmm. So most people would basically murder it or not get through it. So they basically, they knew my last name started with a T and ended with the three letters of day. Right. So basically, I became T Day for that reason because they just didn't want to deal with what was in between. <laughs> and then you avoided the spotlight and were able to keep it. That is a victory in itself. Pretty much. Okay. That should be a medal. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, T Day, I think we have talked about as much as we can here. I'm sure we could go on, but I think we should wrap this up and get out of here. What do you say? Sounds good to me. All right. It's thanks again. It's been a pleasure. All right. Well, Jello, man, what an interview. I absolutely love the way you guys drilled through all the parts of the uh, F-16. So T-Day, very impressive with 29 years and eight months. And what was it, almost 4,200 hours in the F-16? Just the F-16 alone. I think he said he had something like 5,000. Yeah, what a guy. And just, you know, such a heart for sharing it and serving. And we hit it off. I mean, we had a refreshment before and after the interview. And I told him, like, hey, buddy, I want to keep your name on the Rolodex proverbially and use him as a resource for future fighter pilot podcast type stuff. So who knows, maybe folks will hear more of him, but yeah, great dude. And wow, amazing experiences flying almost every block they had. Yeah. And, and I still like him, even though he's a Yusafa, I think an 87 grad. So it won't hold that against him, but, uh, <laughs> nah, nice. you Academy guys. I, I know. know. I know. Right, dude. Totally. It's this, it's this weird kind of, uh, uh, friendly rivalry we have, but also love the, right. I love you guys quoting that, uh, the red Baron, right? So Baron, uh, was it Manfred von Richthofen, I guess. Yeah. That's right. The quality of the box matters little. Success depends upon the man who sits in it. There you go. Now, I would offer, though, Jello, and what you guys said was spot on, but, you know, he died in 1918. So I wonder if he saw what we have today, if he would still keep that same kind of tenant. Oh, good point. Well, I know that Top Gun, for one, still uses that quote. And I suppose the aircraft sitting idly on the ramp is doing no good whatsoever until you put someone in it. So that's a great point. I would offer there's still some some value to that expression. I agree. I totally agree. Yep. So, 
Any other finer points? Anything to clean up on that interview? I thought all the acronyms were really spot on. Very explanatory. Yep. I think everything is either uh, explained or we've heard it before. We'll throw any new terms and expressions, acronyms, etc. into the glossary section on our website, fighterpilotpodcast.com. You can head over there. And again, as we mentioned earlier, look for a behind the scenes video with T-Day coming out in the next few days. All right, Sunshine. Well, let's see. We're going to mix it up going into the future. I like what we did here in April where we broke up the aircraft series a little bit. First episode of the month, which comes out on the 2nd, will be something a little different. And then the next two episodes on the 12th and 22nd, we will continue the aircraft series. But why don't you tell the listener what's coming up on May 2nd? Yeah, so I had the distinct opportunity of going out to the Naval Academy and meeting up with one of my mentors, I would say. So just a highly regarded great American with whom I cruised back in 2007. His name is Ryan Bernacki, and he is the director of the Blue Angel Transition Team. And that would be moving from the legacy F-18s to the Super Hornets for the Blue Angels specifically. And dude, that guy is wicked smart, as the uh, Boston folk would say. And he's got a, he's a, he blows me away, I'll tell you what. So I think the listeners will really, really enjoy the interview. Awesome. Well, I look forward to that. I haven't even listened to it myself, but I'll get through it and we'll make sure it's all nicely edited and ready for everybody. And that will be coming out next time. In the meantime, I want to remind everyone that the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of the hosts and our guest and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components. Now, Sunshine, if I can get a little sappy for a moment, I just want to thank you and the rest of our team for helping make the Fighter Pilot Podcast such a successful podcast. It's really been a lot of fun. And I also want to thank all the listeners who tune in and listen each week, as well as comment on our Facebook and other social media. This has just really, really been a fun engaging activity. I enjoy it. We're going to keep doing it. And so to you, Sunshine, and the team, and to all our listeners, well, thank you. Dude, you're quite welcome. Thanks for bringing me aboard. It started out as just that interview number one. I thought, oh, this is a neat little cute, you know, like pat you on the head, have fun with your project, Jello. And then uh, <laughs> when you invited me to join, I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. And then I am just uh, stunned by the volume of people, where the people are located, and their knowledge base. I mean, especially if you look at our weekly tech talks, right, with the pictures that we post on Facebook and the crazy explications we get of the different pictures and different features on aircraft. So thank you, Jello. You're welcome. Well, for sure. And uh, we enjoy it, but I think we better make them wait another 10 days before their next fix. What do you say? Sounds like a plan. What do we always say? Let's get out of here. See you. You've been listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, brought to you by BVR Productions. Got a question for the show? Send an email to questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to check out our website at fighterpilotpodcast.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. For exclusive Fighter Pilot Podcast content, check out our Patreon page. Please like, follow, and subscribe to the show. And don't forget to share us with your network. Thank you for listening.